关注现在，影响未来。林秀，大家好，欢迎收看评论。今天是邀请一个特别的嘉宾，马里兰州众议员林立图先生，啊、uh, ，Maryland State Delegate d r Clar 呃 Clarence Lane， welcome， thank you， welcome. happy to be here，、mm, yeah， <laughs> nice to meet you， 呃、uh, ，Do you know， 呃、uh, ，Clarence，、uh, what time， what day today？ Today's Halloween. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Today is special day, Halloween. I would have come in a costume, but I didn't think it was appropriate. I think people see、uh, we are the Asian face, right? Yeah. But、uh, Halloween,、uh, in my memory, I just come to United States not Halloween. Yeah. So I think you living United States, born here. So I think you have a lot of Halloween memory, right? Yes. So you can show the public. Yeah, sure. You know, I think one of my earliest,、uh, you know, memories of Halloween was so. You know, obviously my mother is a、uh, is Chinese American, and so she she made all the costumes for、oh. for me. So you know,、um, you know, you go back and and she has photos of all these costumes because she would hand make them. One year it was you know Batman, and it was like handmade Batman、yeah. costume and Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, which now I guess is back in. You know, and so you know she would make costumes for myself and my brother. And we would, you know, all be standing in a line,、uh, you know, with with us in in you know these very nice handmade costumes. I know the the very first memory that I have is、um, she said that、um, you know your first Halloween that that you might remember is you were dressed as a doctor. Oh. You know? And so she said that that may be you know uh, uh, kind of predicting the the future in a way. But she also she made the doctor's costume. So, you know, <laughs> so you know, she, she dressed me as a doctor, right? right? Yeah, yeah. So, so what, you know,、uh, when when this Halloween day,、uh, how old are you? How old are you? How I'm thirty thirty seven. Oh, now thirty seven. Yes. When the first、oh, time? Oh, when I was first time. That was probably about five or six. Whoa! Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's that's the earliest that I remember that、uh, you know I was dressed up in the doctor's. Uh, costume had the stethoscope and the、uh, little doctor's bag,、uh, okay. and she shows me this picture. But yeah, I remind her that like, well, you know, you wanted me to be <laughs> to be dressed as a doctor. That wasn't my choice. But you know, it was a nice costume. Maybe so, maybe、okay. parents need a uh, product, uh, uh, prepare or present for you. Right, right. <laughs> in the future, right. in the future. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah I mean, so the kids、uh, <laughs> is Halloween day is very lucky, very happy. Right, right. right. So I know you just.、Uh, Uh, come from an Asian community family, right? Yeah. So,、uh, tell us, you do you mind tell your family? Yeah,、Are、sure. You,、uh, yeah. So,、um, I was born here in Pennsylvania. Oh, Pennsylvania. And,、okay. uh, but my family is from.、Uh, my mother is from Taiwan, and my father was from Hong Kong. Okay.、Um, and so, you know, my my father's side of the family goes back many years. I think back into China. Um, they、uh, were in Hong Kong for a few years. My grandfather came over to the U.S.、Um, I think by boat over to made his way over to New York City,、oh. where he worked in、um, you know kind of a laundromat or dry cleaning for many years, and was sending、uh, support back to my father and my grandmother. And they had a lot of brothers and sisters, and so. Um, fortunately, after a period of time in the 1970s, most of them were able to kind of come over to the U.S. and join、okay. them in New York City. My mother's side was from Taiwan, and you know, further back was also from、uh, China.、Um, my my grandfather commanded a squad of jeeps during World War II,、oh. and so、um, because of his military service.、Um, Uh, you know, his family was able to come over to to Taiwan, and then my mother came to the U.S. in the 1970s. Oh, 1970s. Okay. So, so my grandmother and father met here in New York, New Jersey. Oh, okay.、Yeah. So your parents are now living in Pennsylvania or Maryland? They still live in Pennsylvania. Oh, I'm, okay. I'm the only one that lives in Maryland.、Uh, so so <laughs> you're just only one living、uh, Maryland, or your family? You married or have kids?、Uh, we haven't had time to have kids. Sarah、oh, and I、okay. have been together for I guess twelve years now,、um, but she wants kids sooner rather than later. So、um, you know we'll probably be looking at that soon. But、um, I also have two younger brothers, one of whom is still in, in、oh, Pennsylvania, but、oh. he's in、uh, medical school now at, at,、oh, in Philadelphia at Drexel University.、Okay. Um, he's the youngest brother, and then I have another brother who is the middle one that is in.、Um, 
New Orleans at Louisiana State University oh, doing his cool. plastic surgery residency. So he's also, I guess we're all going to become doctors, which is you know, strange, <laughs> but, you know, I guess that makes, you know, my, my parents happy, but, um, you know, three doctors in the family, I guess. But, you know, my mom, I'm sure, had to put up with a lot when we were yeah. brothers and, and younger because, you know, when you have three boys, they always fight, right? So, yeah, 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 yeah. so three boys is just always fighting, you know, always <laughs> running around the house. And my mother was the only woman in the house and, and probably you know, had to put up with a lot from us. So, you know, <laughs> okay. I'm sure she wished she had a, a daughter at some point, but unfortunately, she had the three of us. So, so maybe but, you want a daughter, right? <laughs> uh, I'm open to you know whatever. Okay. So, you know. <laughs> uh, people know uh, you just uh, got a PhD degree in medicine. So I, I have a medical degree. Oh, a me yeah, medical, medical degree. Okay. Yeah, from... So why you you just uh, you maybe you can be a good daughter mm -hmm. and a uh, high salaries. Right, good, good life. Uh, people mind why are you uh, running for the state delegate? Right. Uh, because of change your life and uh, become a political man. So, uh, how you make this change? I think it's a big change. Yeah. So people. it's it's that's right. a very good question. Yeah. So you know, for for so a few things for us here in Maryland, we're a part-time legislature. So most okay. of the delegates and senators still have a regular job that they go back to. Oh. So um, some will make it their full-time job. That's, you know, all they do is, is uh, serve in the legislature. But most of us still, you know, are either, you know, a lot of them are lawyers, a lot of them are real oh, yeah, estate yeah, people yeah. or business people. They'll still go back and do their regular job when we're not in Annapolis. And so uh, I still practice medicine. So I'm a physician up on faculty at Johns Hopkins oh. um, at the School of Public Health where I run a residency program. I'm a program director for uh, training other resident physicians in my specialty, which is preventive medicine. Um, and then I see patients down at the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory in Laurel. Um, and so we try to balance all of that, but it's, yeah. a, it's a good question as to why someone who's, you know, so deeply involved in medicine would want to get into, um, you know, policy and, and politics. Yeah. Um, for me, it, go it goes back a while. So when I look back at my childhood, um, you know, I recognize that uh, my family had a lot of opportunities that they wouldn't have had were they not here in the United States. That, oh. um, you know, that just struck me as being... Uh, you know, a very unique, um, you know, kind of experience and, and background for them to be able to, um, you know, really live the American dream, to um, come here with, you know, not many, not many resources, yeah. not much support, yeah. um, but be able to work hard, uh, study hard, um, get a good paying job, support a good family, send three kids to college and then to yeah, medical school, high, yeah. and, um, you know, be very successful in that way. And so, for me, as a second generation, yeah. um, you know, Chinese American, I wanted to be able to continue to give back to the country that I felt like had given so much to my family. And so, you know, community service has always been a part of what I do um, and what's been important to me. And so even in college, when I was, um, you know, trying to figure out what to major in, I double majored in biology and political science oh, because biology was because when you're pre-med, um, you know, biology is very close to it. Um, and so for political science, it was more of my personal interest. I was always interested in, in the broader policy and in politics, how do you get involved and make change through the government, hopefully positive change through the government. And so, um, you know, when, when um, I decided to run for office, um, you know, I also viewed it as kind of an extension of what I do for in, in medicine, right? So medicine, it's very customer service. You have to be very willing to help people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You have to be very sympathetic and empathetic and understand where people are coming from and be very willing to, um, you know, make the sacrifice to help them in, in their health. Um, when you're working in the legislature, you get to do, you have to have that very similar sense of wanting to help people. Yeah. Um, but you are helping them not just restricted to medicine and their health, but also in, you know, their job and the economy yeah. and their businesses and the environment and transportation issues. You get to work on a whole variety of issues, but I think the mindset is very similar where you're in a customer service <laughs> position. You know, the, the, the doctor has to be wanting and desiring to help people. The same thing as a legislator. You have to sympathize with your situation or your concerns and be willing to help them as well. And so in that way, I think it kind of overlaps well. But um, it can be very challenging when you're trying to juggle two yeah, yeah, professions, yeah. right? So you have your legislative uh, career and then you have your professional career, which yeah. is medicine 
and and teaching and I still you know teach courses still you know train other physicians and still see patients and um, yeah it, it can be a lot it's certainly <laughs> you know it's certainly very busy for you know people who are citizen legislatures but I think that's that's important because most states like ours in Maryland are founded on people being citizen legislators and what that means is that they um, you know split their time between being a regular citizen and a legislator and the advantage there is that you bring the experience and the knowledge that you have from um, your real life yeah. to the legislature and your personal experiences too so as a physician you can bring that experience to the legislature because in the Maryland uh, General Assembly for example there's only uh, two other physicians um, that are serving there so they're very few and so we deal with a lot of healthcare matters it's important for us to kind of bring that perspective there um, and then lastly you know I think it's important for us to have representation from people that look like us and share our values and yeah. understand our culture and our heritage and so um, you know for someone like myself when we look at the Maryland General Assembly and up until that point there was only one Chinese American serving in the entire General Assembly and that was uh, Senator Susan Lee yeah. that uh, you know the General Assembly doesn't look like what our community you know looks yeah like. a lot of our Chinese community uh, uh, American living in this area. Right, yeah, the right. Only, and there's only, only, one, only one, one elected representative, uh, and that's why I think it was important too so, that if you had the the skills and the experience and the desire and the knowledge and the ability to run for office, you know, would you be doing a disservice to your community to not run? Um, and so I felt like it was also a responsibility um, to, uh, you know, con to serve the community too. Thank so you. <laughs> Stuff. So, you know, for all of those reasons, that's why I decided to. <laughs> so, to I, run. I have a small question. Uh, uh, maybe I got a message from the newspaper. Mm -hmm. uh, have you ever uh, been visited uh, more than ten, uh, 7,000 uh, American people's house? 7,000? Is a uh, house? It was, almost, I think it was like 20,000. 10? 20,000? 20,000 doors. Whoa! Yeah, yeah. Really? <laughs> yeah. 20,000 doors. Whoa! Yeah. Oh, it's a hard time. I think yeah, that you yeah. Come uh, as my experience, uh, in the past 10 years, I visited more than uh, 1,000 small business owners' uh, house. Oh, wow. yeah. Okay. Yeah, I just yeah, want yeah. to know the economy, how the small right. business owners, what they think, mm -hmm. what they want. Oh, 10 years, uh, 1,000. You right. just... 20,000. 20, well, oh my gosh. It was over two years. It was over, two, year. years. <laughs> it was over hard. two years, yeah. Over yeah, two yeah. years. Over two years, oh. yeah. So it would be... Because uh, when you're campaigning, you have to talk to voters, right? And yeah, 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 yeah. The district that I represent is about 120,000 uh, uh, voters. But when you look at the people that actually vote, it's a much smaller number. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. So you're yeah. trying to contact them, and, and the best way to do that is to actually have face-to-face -face contact with them. And the the most, um, you know, the best way to do that is to, to talk to them at their doors, because you get wow. them at home. So, yeah, every weekend and every uh, evening for two years, I would just be out, you know, it's a list of people, and you're just knocking on doors to figure out who you're supposed to be talking to. So, yeah, it was it was two years of time, and, and you know, 20,000 people later. Wow. That, wow. Uh, Maybe this is the secret to your success. <laughs> yeah, I mean, to, right. To, right. <laughs> A lot of people Champion. that are successful do do knock on a lot of doors because that's what you have to. You have to I hear uh, some people maybe want to run for the uh, congressman or delegate, have the volunteer, mm -hmm. and knock the door. Not a, you just come yourself. Yeah. Uh, one, one, one. All right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, one by one. yeah, we had a lot of volunteers knock doors and make phone calls too, but uh -huh. I think the the best contact that you can have is with your elected officials. Oh, face with to face, face, right? face yeah, directly. So, yeah. so they want to see their their you know candidate or see their legislator face to face, you know, and be able to ask questions or you know understand what their thought is, not just a volunteer, which yeah, I think yeah, is important yeah, yeah. too. We had volunteer teams go out also, but I think it was important for me to to get out there. So yes, it was a it was a long <laughs> a lot of doors, a long period of time, a lot of sacrifice. I think, you know, I think that's that's kind of a, a, a common theme when you're serving in these kinds of, uh, you know, um, you know, leadership positions that you, you do sacrifice a lot for, um, you know, the service to the community. So, you know, I think that's why we, you know, are willing to do it because you're, you're trying to do it for a higher good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, he's a. <laughs> oh, I only remember the, the, the accounting 20,000, right? Yeah, yeah. Oh, uh, I think people who will 
uh, want to run in for the public, <laughs> yeah, maybe you can learn from Dr. Clarence Lane. Yeah, yeah if, anybody, <laughs> if anybody wants to run and is interested in learning more yeah. about how you can run for office or is thinking about running for office, happy to, to talk to them and lend my advice and, and what you can do to, to have a successful campaign. Okay, good. <laughs> so, uh, as we know, each uh, political man say, we need a herd uh, voice from the people, right? Uh, but uh, I think a few, a few people just like to do that, uh, knock door one by one, mm -hmm. more than 20,000. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's not, not easy. <laughs> and uh, another thing, some political men didn't hurt the people's voice uh, because uh, the people uh, different mind, mm -hmm. different uh, background, different education, different culture. Right. So in one case, uh, different mind. So how do you keep the balance? Do you uh, hurt the Maryland? Uh, uh, trust act. Mm -hmm. I I know a lot of different uh, voice. Yeah, yeah. So how do you think? Uh, uh, I mean, I think actually so. I got the message. Some Chinese people don't like you. Told me I don't like <laughs> like the guy. The guy before is good. Right. Now he's bad. <laughs> I don't like it. So you need to show something more. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I'm happy to to speak about you know that issue or even just more broadly how do yeah. we represent people. So you know I think I think. Um, so a few things. One, just generally speaking, you know, we are elected to represent a district, right? So um, my district is parts of Howard County and Baltimore County. So yeah. if there's anyone living in uh, uh, Columbia or Catonsville or Butis, Halesworth, Lansdowne, right up to the Baltimore city line, that those are the people that I directly represent in the General Assembly. Um, and so you know, we have to try to balance different perspectives, yeah, yeah. right? Because we are primarily responsible to the district that we represent, right? So yeah, Susan yeah, yeah. Lee represents a district here in Montgomery County. Yeah. They may have very different perspectives than other districts, right? So if you look at um, Ocean City, right there, somebody representing Ocean City might have very different priorities than in Columbia. Um, and so, you know, I try to reflect the the um, values and the perspectives of the district that I represent, because those are the people that can vote for me or not yeah, vote yeah, yeah. for me. Um, you know, so in, for the most part, issues that I will support or oppose, that's because the district that I represent, most people support or oppose, um, you know, at least from, from my perspective. And so um, that's kind of how I, I weigh which issues to, to kind of, um, you know, favor or, or disfavor. Um, that it's really my reflection and my vote is and support or not support is a reflection of the district that I represent. So with specific issues, you know, so you bring up the the Trust Act for yeah, example. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, and that was an issue that I think is was very important to my district also. Um, you know, my district is mostly uh, white, um, maybe, um, you know, 20, 25 percent African American. Okay. Um, and then... Um, probably five or six percent uh, Asian American, Asian, okay. and then probably about the same is is Latino or Hispanic, okay. and so, you know, when it comes to the when it comes to the Trust Act, you know, I think there was a lot of um, misinformation that was taking place about what it actually did. Yeah. So, you know, I spoke to a lot of people um, that uh, are from the community, and when you ask them what the Trust Act is, the Maryland Trust Act. Um, people had very wildly different opinions about what the bill actually yeah, did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and I think a lot of people didn't actually read the bill. And so, you know, I, you know, sat down, read the bill, um, talked to the people who actually wrote the bill to understand what it actually did. And when you sit down and think about it, I think it makes a lot of sense, but it takes some time to explain the, the bill. And so, um, usually I try to give a short explanation so people can understand why you know, my district and why I think that, you know, it's something that we would support. So the issue with the Trust Act is that, one, um, it does two main things. So the first thing that it does is um, it says that people that um, are arrested for something, um, uh, that they cannot be held for longer than they need to be held, right? And so if the federal government says that we want to hold this person for longer, you have to go to a judge and tell the judge why 
this person should be held longer because they're a risk to the community or they may flee, so you have to hold them in jail longer. Yeah. Um, and what the Trust Act did was say that you have to, the federal government, if they want to hold somebody longer, whether it's an immigrant or undocumented or documented, it doesn't matter. If you want to hold somebody longer, then um, you need to go to a judge and get them to sign a warrant, which is a um, judicial uh, requirement for them to hold them longer, that you can't just send a request. So what the federal government used to do is just, you know, sign a piece of paper saying, we request that you hold this person longer, and they would send it to the jail, and the jail would say, okay, this is a request, but it's not a legal document that's been signed by a judge, what do I do? Um, that's the controversy there, that the that people are saying that um, you know, if it hasn't been presented to a judge and a judge isn't convinced or signed off on it, then you shouldn't be able to hold people longer than they need to be. Um, so that's the first thing that the Trust Act did. The second thing that the Trust Act did was it said that it prevents racial profiling. It says that law enforcement, so the police or sheriff in your area, may not be able to come to you and you're walking down the street and stop you and say, show me your immigration papers, show me your passport, show me your green yeah, card. Not good. Um, and so we were certainly concerned about that because of other instances that had happened throughout um, the area. But, um, you know, that's, that's racial profiling, right? So you just, you look different. And so police will just stop you and ask you, where are you from? You know, where, where are your papers? Are you legal here? Are you not legal here? Um, and that's what the Trust Act, that was the second part of the Trust Act, which says that you cannot Law enforcement here in Maryland, so the state police, the county police, the local sheriff, cannot stop people and racially profile them and ask them for their documentation or put them into a database. Um, those are the two main things that the Trust Act actually did. Um, and so when you think about it, you know, us as a community, as Asian Americans, we don't want to be racially profiled, right? Um, there have been cases where, um, you know, up in Harford County here in Maryland, where an Indian American woman who lived in her neighborhood for, you know, decades was walking down the street, um, but maybe she looked Muslim, even though she's not, because she's Indian, she's Hindu. Um, somebody saw her walking down the street and called the police and said, there's some suspicious woman looking, walking down the street, you should come check her out. So the police came to her, started asking her questions and asked her if she was here legally, if she had her uh, green card or papers, she was a citizen. And she was being feel bad. <laughs> and she, yeah, she was being made to, she was embarrassed, she was made to feel ashamed. Um, and so that was right here in Maryland. You hear cases throughout the country that are horrible of people being racially profiled. Like there was this case of an Indian American elderly man, like 70 or 80 years old, down in Alabama. He didn't understand any English. The police came up to him. This was in the South. The police came up to him and said, you know, stop, I want to see your papers. He didn't understand. So he was kind of making this kind of emotion. He said, no English, no English. The police got angry and shoved him and slammed him on the ground, and he ended up being in the hospital and paralyzed. And so, you know, it's instances like that that we're trying to prevent. You know, I think everyone understands from our community why racial profiling is not a good thing. You know, when you look at jobs, for example, Wen Ho Lee and the whole case from, from back then, you know, Victor Chin was racially profiled from, you know, the 1980s or 90s. You know, we understand and are sensitive to racial profiling just because we do look different, we shouldn't be treated differently. And so, um, you know, for those reasons, that's why, you know, I supported the, the Maryland Trust Act, because I think for, for our community, um, it's the right thing to do. And for my district, the majority of the people that live in my district, even though they're not, or mostly majority is white, I think they would support the, the, uh, the Maryland Trust Act. I think there's also a lot of misconceptions about what um, undocumented immigrants um, can do to a community. You know, when we had people testifying down in Annapolis, we heard, uh, uh, you know, concerns about how this might affect schools, for example, or how this might take jobs away from people, or how this might increase crime. And the reality is, because I did some research, because as a, as a doctor, you know, I wanted to make sure I followed the evidence and followed data. And the data all shows that those are um, not true, that those are all misconceptions. People have this myth in mind that it increases crime. It actually um, would decrease crime because it allows undocumented people to feel more comfortable to approach the police, right? If they don't feel like they're going to ask for their papers and yeah, yeah, whether yeah. they're legal or not, but you as an undocumented person, if you see a crime happening down the street, do you want to call the police 
or tell them, or do you want to not call the police? Who's on? Usually not, not a call, right? Yeah, so you don't call the police. So you know, instances like that actually make the community less safe um, because people are less willing to contact them. There's um, uh, people will say that they use government services more often. Um, most undocumented people don't use many government services because they're afraid to fill out a form and then they go into some database and the database finds out that they're illegally yeah. here, they're illegal here. So actually, you know, they don't use many government services. They're not on usually on welfare. They're not usually getting uh, government benefits because they're afraid to actually access those services. A lot of them still pay taxes, right? So if they're buying things in the store, they still yeah, pay yeah, yeah, yeah. sales tax. A lot of them are still paying income tax. Um, so they're paying into the system. They're actually not getting many benefits. And um, uh, there's this misconception that, um, you know, that, that uh, they're taking jobs from people. Oftentimes these undocumented are taking some of the lowest paying jobs that are available. Yeah. They're usually not jobs that most people want to take. Um, so for example, farmers that are, um, you know, throughout the country, a lot of them use undocumented because they can't find other people that are willing to stand in the field out in the sun and pick these fruits or pick these vegetables. So, you know, farmers actually are very supportive of, of uh, you know, sound immigration policy because it'll help them continue to get workers that will actually work in the field. And then finally, there's a misconception that it actually hurts our schools. And, uh, you know, I think the data, when you look at it, shows that the diversity that you increase the schools by doesn't actually harm the schools. It actually gives more benefit for people to expose to students to be exposed to people of different cultures, just like we're of a different culture and heritage, that, um, you know, that's also a misconception amongst the general public. So, you know, for all of those reasons, um, you know, I think there are a lot of myths. There's a lot of misunderstanding about what the bill actually does. The bill does not do anything about uh, federal immigration policy because people think, oh, it's just going to make an open door. Everyone's going to move to Maryland. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's federal people policy. Worry. Yeah, people, people worry, right. pay attention to just want the safe community. Right, yeah. right. In I think in this year, just February or February, maybe in the Rockville mm -hmm. uh, Montgomery High School, mm -hmm. uh, two two guy heard a girl just 14 years old. You mm -hmm. heard the. Uh, the case? Yes, I heard yeah, the case. So people feel very, very bad. We worry our child in the school, middle school, high school, maybe be hurt for the, you know. Yeah, so there's, so there's two interesting so, things about that case, is that yeah. people actually brought that case as an yeah, example yeah, yeah. down to Annapolis. So, and so I think a lot of people worried. It's, it's real worried, I think. Mm -hmm. Not only just keep the benefits and no spread for others. Yeah. Just safe is very important. Right. And uh, so something important to keep in mind about that case yeah. is people did come to us and yeah. it's local to here in Rockville because uh, it happened at one of the local high schools. So number one, the Trust Act wouldn't have affected that person's case, right? The Trust Act only affects people who have already been arrested to make sure they don't get released. The student in that instance who um, was alleged to have done the crime, he was never arrested to begin with. Right, oh. so he would never have been caught in the system, which is what the Trust Act was was getting at. Right, so the Trust Act says that if you're arrested, you can't be released. Uh, you know, you can't be held without a a judge signing the piece of paper. Um, and so, you know, the, the opponents, the people who don't like the Trust Act, say that well, they should be held as if they're arrested. Well, the student in Rockville, he was never arrested. He had no yeah, yeah. prior criminal. Um, one arrest. is a seventeen. One is eighteen. Yeah. 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 But they'd never been arrested, so they yeah. never would have been caught by the police until they did that crime. Number two is that just a couple of weeks ago, they were, they were acquitted of that crime. So people hear about the first thing, and they never hear about the, <laughs> the, the details or okay. the follow-up of, of what happened there. And so, yes, just a couple weeks ago, here in Rockville, he, he was acquitted of, they were acquitted of, um, okay. of that alleged rape. And so, you know, it didn't really... But nobody hears about that, right? So, yeah, yeah, first time, right? No. right. You know, and that's that's the problem. There's a lot of there is a lot of misinformation, and uh, people have a very gut reaction. Um, but some things are just you know being linked unnecessarily. So another example is down in Annapolis when people were testifying on the Trust Act, they were linking you know if when you I read some of the testimony that people came down with, and the testimony actually said that you know it's because of policies like the Trust Act that led to 9-11, that led to September 11th. And, you know, those are some of the most ridiculous, you know, <laughs> allegations to think that, you know, a, a, a policy like the Trust Act could ever lead to or, or have anything to do with 9-11. 
Um, those folks were here mostly on, on green cards or visas. And so, um, you know, there's a fundamental misunderstanding, right? And there are other people that say, when you read the testimony that they gave in Annapolis, that it's because of, uh, you know, policies like the Trust Act, that you have MS-13 and gangs, you know, proliferating here. Well, but we have gangs here regardless, you know, their gangs are involved mostly with drugs and drugs, you know, aren't necessarily dealing with, you know, the undocumented. And so there's a lot of misunderstanding out there of, of you know, what's I know sometimes it's very hard to keep it yeah, balance. Yeah. I know. Yeah, but, and it takes a lot of time to explain, which is <laughs> the, the tough part too, because we just spent a couple but, minutes going through I know, this. I like, know, uh, just uh, this, uh, just uh, February, yeah. we delivered a statement, right, mm -hmm. about the act. Right. Yeah, a lot of uh, Chinese people live in McMurray County, disagree with you, and uh, something happened in uh, the house of Maryland, right? Mm -hmm. the, the people feel upset. <laughs> yeah. Right. So, right. So sometimes I know uh, your opinion and uh, the people's opinion sometimes are different, mm -hmm. big difference. So, uh, some some opinion uh, agree you, some di mm -hmm. uh, disagree you. Mm -hmm. But sometimes uh, I saw. I saw officer just uh, delegate, mm -hmm. uh, people brought you, right? right, right and uh, you right. sometimes you show the, the voice of the Asian community. Right. Uh, but in some cases, the diff, uh, big difference. Mm -hmm. So how do you keep the balance? You just follow your own opinion, just follow the, the people for who wrote you. And mm -hmm. another thing, uh, maybe it's, uh, you can discuss with uh, the people mm -hmm. who disagree with you, not only say, Oh, she agree you. I don't. Mm -hmm. You, you, you. Why? So it's a big difference. Right. So people maybe know you have you, you want to do something. You, you have your reason, mm -hmm. but uh, you can discuss with us just, uh, just like angry, right? <laughs> yeah. right so right. this is important, I think, right in this country. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. I think it's it's important to to be civil um, and to recognize that there are going to be times when people disagree. Uh, you know, I think we're in a very challenging political environment these days where people are trying to generate, um, you know, controversy. You see that on the national level yeah, yeah. Uh, quite a bit. Um, but I think for us, I think it's important for uh, the community to, um, you know, to still have a civil discussion about these issues, right? Yeah, yeah. You and I can disagree or, you know, people can disagree. But you have to be able to talk it out and yeah. explain to each other why you yeah, believe yeah, this yeah. or why you believe yeah. this. And I think that's being lost in part of this discussion where uh, you know people are being um, uh, either I think people are being pushed to the extremes, right? So I don't think the extremes on either end are are positive because the best governance, you know, as somebody who is trying to create good policy, the best policy usually comes out of some type of a compromise between different positions, right? You're not going to get everything you want. You're not going to get yeah, everything yeah, yeah. you want. Let's try to find some way to work in the middle. And that's usually the best uh, solution to, to problems. The middle way. The mi right, right, the moderate, the middle way. But what we're seeing in the in the community and oftentimes in, in the Asian communities is that people are being pushed to the extremes. That, um, for example, the Trust Act, there was a lot of misinformation. Maybe it was deliberate. Maybe it was intentional. Uh, I'm not sure. I suspect that some of it was. Um, to put information out there that wasn't accurate, that would generate uh, people to come out and testify because they were angry or because they were yeah. frustrated, because um, because of fear, you know. And fear is a very strong motivating factor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I think there are elements of the community that are using fear and anger to motivate people to come testify and to motivate people to. Uh, you know, come out and 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 not be willing to compromise, um, and I think that's a very intentional effort by some organizers to use fear and uh, anger as a tool to push people out to get them to do something. It's hard to get people to do something if they're happy. Yeah, yeah, right? you know, yeah, if yeah. If you're happy, you know, you have a good job, you're happy with your family, you enjoy your weekend and TV. You know, you don't want to get out and do something, right? You'll do something because it's something that makes you angry, that kind of, you know, 
you know, pokes at you and makes you angry so, and you want to come out. And that's what I think This is why Donald Trump is the president, right? Right, 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 exactly. That it's easy to generate, uh, you know, anger and easy to generate fear and easy to get people to do something based on anger and fear. It's much more difficult to get somebody to do something based yeah, on, yeah, yeah. on a positive, on inspiration, on enthusiasm, on genuine interest. And so... Um, what I'm concerned about within our community is that we have some, I think there are some organizers that are intentionally using fear and anger um, to push people to the extremes. And I think that's not healthy for our community to be pushed to the extremes. It's not healthy internally to our community because it's dividing us. We're not, you know, we're a minority group. We're not a huge number. And when you divide us more, we have even less of a voice. And then the other problem is that externally, the, the general public, most people looking at the Asian community or the Chinese community say that, oh, now they're so extreme. Well, it's just a small group that's, you know, being very vocal and being very extreme. But it makes the, it gives the general impression that all of us are kind of like that. Um, because we look different and for the general public, they just assume that, you know, if you got 30 Asian Americans showing up in Annapolis testifying in opposition, they can't tell the difference if they're Japanese or Korean yeah, or matter. Chinese or whoever. Um, they just assume, oh, all Asian Americans have the same point of view. And so uh, there's two problems. That one is internal to our community, pushing people to the polar opposites. And two, from external, from an external perspective, they're looking at us like, what's wrong with you people? Like, why are you so extreme? When the reality is most you know, Asian Americans are not. Most are, are in yeah, the yeah, yeah, and yeah, are yeah, civil yeah. and able to have a respectful... Yeah conversation but I think there's some organizers out there that are intentionally trying to do that so maybe you can do more job uh, guard the Chinese Americans trust <laughs> yeah absolutely we're, we're continuing to try to yeah, reach people out to want, people. Uh, yeah. a political man can uh, can fight you for the uh, Chinese Asian Americans you know mm -hmm. community yeah this is important this is why people pay attention to you and Susan Lee mm -hmm. and other Asian Right. Yeah, yeah. So the other, the other important point in, yeah. in politics yeah. is that, uh, and I think it's important for the audience to understand this is that, uh, you know, you're never going to agree with everyone 100 percent of the yeah, time. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know. These are hard. And uh, who might be your who who you might disagree with today is somebody that you need tomorrow. Yeah. Right. Because you know so you I might have, disagree with well, okay. on this topic, but next topic I'm going to need so you. So I, I have another topic. Yeah, I have another. So just uh, the, uh, I think you know, five million. Chinese people live in the United States, uh -huh. and uh, people pay another very, very important thing. Just uh, have you ever heard uh, California just uh, AB 1726 yes. uh, data collection? Yeah, Chinese people don't want, do not want to separate from the Asian community. Mm -hmm. So we are worried about the education, the health, maybe another the benefits of the government. So yeah. how do you think this? Uh, Thing. Yeah, this issue. Yeah, so it's that's a very, 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 it, it is a very yeah. important issue. Yeah. Um, so this is the California AB 1726. Yeah. Uh, yeah. um, it is a very important issue, and um, I've actually had the opportunity to speak to the the to the uh, uh, um, uh, the representative who sponsored that bill. So that okay. was sponsored by uh, <clears throat> Assemblyman. Uh, um, Rob Bonta over in California, and I talked to him about this bill and what it actually did. So a few things. One, um, there is, uh, you know, I think it is important to, to bear in mind um, the importance of data collection, right? So I'm a physician. Um, you know, we do things based on evidence. We don't want to, you know, treat you or have you go through yeah, yeah, surgery yeah, yeah, yeah. because we don't because we didn't get the chest x-ray or we didn't do the CAT scan, we're just going to assume and then we're going to do the surgery and find out that, oh, we opened you up and mm, it's not the right thing, right? So for, from my perspective as somebody who is you know, trained in science and has a background in medicine, wants to follow data and evidence, I think it's important for us to have good information on different demographic people um, and groups. And so, for example, hepatitis C is a condition that affects uh, the Asian American community and specifically the Chinese American community more than other, um, you know, ethnicities, more than, than whites, right? So Asians, for some reason, are more prone to catching uh, hepatitis C as a condition. Um, you know, there are other conditions where different ethnic groups have higher prevalence or higher incidence of that occurring. So from a science standpoint, you know, I think collecting data is, is important, um, particularly when it comes to health. Now, um, uh, 
uh, you know, when you look at AB 17, um, you know, 26, okay. um, it asks the state of California to collect data, but importantly, it actually excludes um, higher education, excludes colleges yeah, and yeah. universities, right? Yeah. So I think there was a lot of misconception that it's also going to affect um, you know, college admissions and yeah. who is going to get into college admissions because I know that's a very sensitive topic with affirmative action and holistic admissions and whatnot. But um, this bill that was passed into law actually doesn't touch college admissions. It's not allowed to collect information on who's admitted to colleges or not. It's only on other factors, which I think are important for um, a community to better understand, you know, if you're being affected more by hepatitis C, we need to figure out why, and we need to target more resources, more treatment, more, uh, you know, medications, more doctors to be able to offer, you know, you or other, you know, ethnic groups that are more affected by that condition, um, you know, services and programs and support. Um, you can't do that if you don't have good data. And we know that there's differences within, you know, the different ethnic groups. You know, we have different, um, uh, you know, health conditions and, and um, uh, you know, demographics than the Koreans, than the Vietnamese, than the Japanese. You know, there's subtle differences there. Um, we know them. The general public doesn't know them. But we can't, you know, target those services to people and make them most effective and get people the help they need to get if we don't have good data or information. So that's why, you know, I think that's a very, um, it's a very important bill and it's, it's, I'm glad that you brought that up. Um, there are misconceptions about what it does. It doesn't touch, you know, academic centers. It doesn't touch colleges and universities. I know that's very sensitive to people. This is really just about, you know, being able to have basic information so that, you know, for example, as me as a physician, you don't want me treating you without getting a basic, you know, blood test or chest x-ray. You know, you want to have that information knowing what you are doing going into it. Um, and so that's kind of what this, this bill does. So you agree? I think the bill, you know, means well and I think the bill, um, you know, has protections in place to make sure that, um, uh, you know, it's not going to be profiling people in, in certain ways. And I think in general, from a scientific perspective, I think the need is there for some kind of legislation to be able to get better information for um, state programs and services from different ethnic communities. So as you know, uh, Chinese Americans come from different parts. Some mm -hmm. come from Taiwan, mm -hmm. Hong Kong, mainland China, maybe Thailand, right? right? So if, if after this bill, uh, you may be Taiwanese, I may be Chinese, yeah. <laughs> I don't know, I mean, Taiwanese, right? Yeah. So this uh, people uh, think is not a good choice. And another one, why just celebrate the, the Asian community? Why uh, the come from people come from Europe? Mm -hmm. Do you know which one come from Japan, uh, uh, Germany, mm -hmm. from Italy? Right. No, we don't so, know. We right. still don't know why. So it's not necessary. We think mm -hmm. it's not necessary. So a few okay. reasons why I think um, uh, you know one the Asian continent is huge. You know you got probably three or four billion people, right? It's the biggest continent <laughs> over any of the other ones. It's much more people than, than say, Europe. Uh, much more people than but Africa. But in the United States, just more parts, right? Yeah, you know? <laughs> but it's, it's, um, it's growing, and it's the fastest growing immigrant population in the U.S. is actually the Asian population. Um, you know, I think we were artificially held down because of things like the Chinese Exclusion Act and other policies up until the 1960s that were finally opened up. But otherwise, we would have um, a much larger population in the U.S. But now um, that that's open, we're the fastest growing immigrant population in the U.S. And so, you know, I think it's important to bear in mind when most of these immigrants are coming from, from Asia, then even from South America or from Central America, and definitely more than from Africa, that, you know, I think it's a reflection of actually our prominence in the community, in society, that we've risen to a level that it's important for us to better understand and, and for the government to better understand our community and how they can provide services to us. You know, if we were, if we were you know, small number, like, you know, Africans moving to the U.S., it's, it's a small percentage, um, then, you know, people would care less. But because we are actually 
the largest, you know, immigrant population, we've actually risen in prominence, which I think is good. <laughs> you know, I think all of us want to see more, you know, uh, you know, uh, immigrants from Asia to be able to come here. But we also know there are distinct differences, and probably more distinct differences culturally um, in Asia, in the different Asian countries, than there are between, say, Germany and Poland. Right? Yes, there are different countries, yeah, but yeah. the differences between <clears throat> Germans and Polish probably not to the same degree of differences between, say, Indonesians and Japanese. That's a big difference oh, yeah. there, right? There's a lot of differences there, and there's fewer differences than, say, the French and the British. You know? <laughs> so, I, I know, if you just survey the people, it's maybe this reason is okay, but people very worried in the future, what will happen? Right, yeah. and that's so why this I think, is the reason. That's this why I think it needs point. to be, you need to have proper protections in the bill, right? So excluding colleges and universities, I think that makes sense. Um, you know, making sure that this data cannot be accessed by other, by like law enforcement, for example, I think that makes sense. Um, you know, this data obviously does need to be protected, but just because you say that like, I don't want to know what's going on out there is not a good enough reason to not provide the level of service and care to people that they may need. So, you know, I think you have to properly protect the data. I think I totally agree with that point. Yeah, it's um, very, very important. And so. that's very important. And, and uh, you know, but I think it's also important to be able to, uh, you know, get people the types of services and programs that they need. And if we just turn a blind eye and say, well, we need to pretend like there's no difference between everybody, then, you know, you're not going to get that level of service. Right. So um, I think it's actually a reflection of the importance of Asians in the U.S. that people are finally paying attention to say, oh, they're not just a small group anymore. They're actually a, a large group and they're growing. They're the fastest growing group. We need to be able to help and, and provide services and better understand how we can tailor programs and funding and grants and et cetera to this community. Otherwise, you know, we're going to be, you know, we don't want to be treated as a very small community, we want to be a prominent community that has some level of importance. And I think this is a reflection of that. But you're right, you have to have the proper protections in place to be able to do that. Okay, people I think uh, I got your opinion. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I think so too. <laughs> uh, so, uh, another question. Uh, how do you think uh, the President Donald Trump, do you like him? Or... So, um, you know, he's obviously a very controversial figure. Um, and, you know, I think nationwide there's been diminishing support for, for him. I think in, in, in um, you know, as we were speaking earlier, we, we try to reflect the priorities and, the, and what's important to our district. You know, the president's policies for my district have been very detrimental. They have not been good for my district in, in a few different ways. Um, you know, when it comes to education, he appointed a education secretary that doesn't believe in public schools, that would rather put yeah, money yeah, into, yeah, yeah, yeah. into charter schools <coughs> or parochial schools. You know, that's not what my district wants. In Columbia and in Baltimore County, we want to make sure that people can use their public schools because that's what they're paying their tax dollars for. Yeah. We should not be taking funding and support away from public schools. When it comes to uh, jobs, a lot of people that live in my area work for the federal government. You know, maybe NIH, maybe FDA, yeah, yeah, yeah. maybe, um, you know, one of the other uh, federal departments or agencies. He is cutting down the budget and he's refusing to, he's put a hiring freeze in place. And so these are people that live in my district um, and they're, asked, they're being asked to work harder because they can't fill open positions or some of them are being left unfilled. So less people are getting, un, are, are being employed. So it's increasing potential for uh, you know, unemployment in my district, so that's been, you know, a negative. He's promised a large transportation infrastructure package, uh, but he hasn't paid any attention to being able to, uh, you know, the details of it or in sponsoring legislation that in Congress that will uh, put money out there. You know, he promised billions and billions of dollars of transportation money to uh, states and, and counties. Where is that? You know, he's, there's been too much, um, you know, attention being paid to other issues, um, investigations and such, and there's been very little attention to being paid to actually making the change and upholding the commitments that um, he's put into place. When it comes to small businesses and, and corporations and businesses in my area, you know, I've talked to a lot of business owners, and you have too, I know, yeah. and they all say that, you know, what they really need is stability, 
right? They don't want to be one year doing this and the next year doing that, and all of a sudden somebody says this and you have to change and change everything you're doing. But stability is incredibly important to be able to, for small businesses to be able to plan ahead. And what we've seen out of the federal government is a complete lack of stability, that policies change, policies have done a U-turn. Sometimes it, this group is saying this, and then the president says this. Sometimes the secretary says this, That's and then the deputy secretary confused. says that. <laughs> Everybody is confused. And so that instability, I think, has been very detrimental to the business community and in foreign policy, right? We, used to, we are seeing, we're in a period where our foreign policy has been all over the place. Somebody, you know, the Secretary uh, Tillerson will say this, the Trump president will say that. Who knows what's actually going on? I just got back from, from Japan. There's been a lot of, uh, you know, we spoke to a lot of um, business members there, people in the American Chamber of Commerce of Japan, people in the, um, you know, Japanese Chamber, who said that they are concerned about doing business here because they don't know what's actually taking place. The foreign policy and the foreign instability with North Korea, and yeah. um, other situations around the world have led people to become more concerned. Um, and then, you know, healthcare has been an issue for, for my district. What we're seeing in healthcare taking place now is, is probably the worst. That's the uh, worst case scenario with, you know, uncertainty being put in, premiums going up, subsidies being taken away. So people now have to pay more for copay or co insurance because that's what he just signed an executive order to take back. Um, you know, this is all going to be negative to, to people in my district. Um, and then lastly, as a person who, who grasps science and medicine and evidence, yeah. that we are, you know, we're seeing an administration that's completely disregarding science, right? That the science says this is happening or the science says, you know, you need to be concerned about, you know, the Chesapeake Bay and the health of the environment and, you know, people are just disregarding it. And even people that are scientists within the government that are you know, usually be able to go to conferences, be able to speak about their research, speak about what's going on, are being muzzled. They're being told, you can't go to this conference. You can't talk about this. You're going to be fired if you speak up. Um, that's not the way science is done. And so in that way, you know, I, I find that um, you know, disconcerting too. So um, I guess it's not been positive, I can say that. <laughs> <you know? laughs> Uh, in the next two weeks, uh, President Trump will visit China, mm -hmm. I think maybe one or two days, but it's very important. Uh, how mm -hmm. do you think uh, the relationship between US and China in the future? Now, sometimes like friends, sometimes like fighter, like enemy. <laughs> right, right. So how do you think the future, China and the US? So I think two things, one yeah. in the near term and then another in the long, long term. term. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So in the near term, I don't know because the president is so unpredictable that, you know, he may say one thing and it might not actually mean anything. And <laughs> okay. I, think, I think the general public is recognizing uh, that um, because even the secretary of state, I think, is, is facing some frustration that sometimes he goes out there and puts policy out and the president will undercut him later on. Um, so I don't know what's going to take place in the short term. I am concerned that when it comes to policies um, that have to do with the security of this country and other partners in the Asian um, hemisphere, that um, we need better stability. We need to be able to have a good partnership with China to be able to pressure North Korea to stop what they're doing. Yeah. Right, and that is built on a good relationship. And if that relationship is not good, then you're going to have a, a problem. You know, I think there's, um, uh, uh, you know, when it comes to um, security issues like that, we're seeing more and more conflict in, say, the South China Sea with some islands that are out there that are yeah. under controversy. Um, you know, when I just came back from Japan, every business meeting that I had, the business leaders were asking me. Why did you guys back out of the Trans-Pacific Partnership, the TPP? <laughs> they all wanted the TPP, and yeah, they were all very angry that we backed out of the TPP. And so, you know, I think that's a that's really unfortunate for our country because I think that's going to set us back. That's really to the benefit of China because it lets them be able to kind of influence the hemisphere even more. Um, where you know there are balances of power, and it's basically if the U.S. is going to step back from that balance of power then China can really step up and, and you know, potentially show some leadership there yeah. that the Americans are not. Um, in the long term, I don't know. You know, I think, I think China is an important partner for us because it is such a large nation, has such a strong economy, yeah. has such uh, many resources that we need to have a good partnership with China. We can't 
Um, you know, I don't think it's healthy to view it as an adversarial relationship. We need to have a partnership. Um, um, and so, you know, anything that continues to move in that direction, I think in the long term will be good. Um, you know, we're seeing increasing globalization, uh, regardless of what the president or other, you know, more fringe elements say, um, that uh, the world is becoming an increasingly globalized place. Businesses can move around. Um, goods are, or goods can move, move around, businesses are doing business all across the world. Um, you know, workers are, um, uh, you know, having to be more skilled in that way. Um, and so that's the challenge of, you know, the reality of today. It's just yeah, like yeah. you can't fight the Industrial Revolution back from the 1800s when we moved yeah, to yeah, machines. Yeah. You can't fight the Internet because, you know, the information age is the information age. Um, and now we're seeing a new age of globalization and you can't, you know, there's no way to turn that back either. So you have to learn to work within the system. And I think those who say that you can turn that back are probably mistaken. But I think um, because we're becoming, we're in an increasing globalized world, China is going to be an important partner for the U.S. And so, you know, that's something I do emphasize to other businesses, particularly here, that are looking to do foreign work, that you really have to look at um, markets like China because, you know, if you're able to get into that market, it's huge, you know. So that's why companies like Apple, you know, and Dell and... Big um, market. Right, and, right, and Samsung and all of them want to get into that market because it's a huge market. And so... Um, you know, we need to continue to partner and foster that. So have you ever been to China? I have not been to China yet. <laughs> I've been to, to Taiwan, Taiwan, to Hong Kong, to uh, Japan, right? to Japan uh, recently. Um, but China and Korea are, on my, are next on my list. Okay. So, you know. <laughs> uh, so sometimes, uh, I'm, I know we are just the same age, just mm -hmm. 1980s, right, right, right? right? So sometimes I, I think you are very lucky uh, because uh, in China, uh, people cannot vote for the president, mm -hmm. cannot uh, vote for the governor, for the city council, right. for the congressman. I think just uh, five or six years ago, I just want to serve the public people. I just want to run for the congressman, but mm -hmm. cannot, I find, because some friends uh, running for the congressman be put in the jail for, by the government. So uh, no yeah. real democracy, yeah. no freedom. Right. So this is a Big, uh, big difference, I think. Right. So I think uh, I saw a second generation, right? You, mm -hmm. you just born here, mm -hmm. uh, come from Chinese community, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, do you support the democracy in China? How do you think it's the future of China? As That's a, a good people, question. Yeah. You know, I think uh, you know we're gonna. I think over my lifetime, we're probably gonna see a lot of change there. Um, I think. Uh, you know, I think the 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 challenge there is that China is changing very rapidly itself, right? Um, you're seeing more and more people move to the cities, to urbanization. These yeah. cities that were smaller now are, are ballooning large. Nobody's living in the rural areas anymore. Um, and so, um, you know, you're seeing the, the growing pains of industrialization and a very rapid industrialization. You see, you know, a lot of pollution. <laughs> you see a lot of, uh, you know, buildings and development being going up some, you know, going up very quickly. And so, um, you know, you're seeing that kind of growing pain in the near term. But I think, um, you know, for the democracy in the long term, you're seeing them it's a very it's a very different government because it's it's you know traditional so communist one party rule. Yeah, it's yeah. one party rule. It's formally still a communist government, but uh, when you look at how they're purchasing and how they're doing business, it's very capitalistic, right? Everything's all about transactions and and money and revenue and profit these yeah. days. Uh, the the very rich in China are getting you know much richer. Um, the general public is doing a little bit better, yeah, but yeah, you know, yeah. not not to the degree that the yeah. rich people are. Yeah, just yeah, yeah. There's a huge yeah, yeah. difference there. I think they need to be worried about that. We're yeah, seeing yeah, that yeah, here yeah. in the U.S. The so society problem. <laughs> right, the society will tear apart when yeah. when when there's such a large gap between the very rich and the normal people. Yeah. Um, that to some extent is what we saw here in the U.S. That the rich are getting richer, the middle class is. Yeah, the same stuff should happen. Right, yeah. they're having more problems, and, and uh -huh. you know that may be one reason Donald Trump was elected. That yeah. you know that that fabric was being torn apart, and I think they're going to see more of that in in China. They're able to keep a lid on that more because they are able to control the press and control information better here. We have the First Amendment where everything is open and people share whatever they want or not. Sometimes true and sometimes fake, but um, you know the 
democracy in the long term, I think they're going to have to open up more because, um, you know, you, you're, they're opening everything up except the government, right? Like you were saying, you can't just run for office. You know, there's you can't, the media. everything's controlled. Yeah, yeah. You know, who's serving in office is controlled. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, I think this but, is the reason I hate the data collection because yeah. in China, the government collect everything. Everything, yeah. yeah everything, yeah. You, you bill, your credit card, you whatever but, where you go. Right. Yeah. And uh, maybe on the bus, the policeman can check your ID. Right. <laughs> yeah, we don't like. But uh, yeah, yeah. it's actually happening in China now, most of the cities. Right. Uh, before, just in uh, the West City, Xinjiang, mm -hmm. Urumqi, now the Shanghai, big city, happening in Shanghai. Yeah. So I, we don't know what will happen in the future. Maybe, <laughs> yeah, it's very hard. Yeah, I think it'll be hard to predict, but I think they, I think, you know, the wheels of, of history turn towards democracy and, and greater freedom. You look at Cuba, yeah, like yeah, yeah, fifty yeah. years ago, right? Yeah, Fidel yeah. Castro, everything was communist. Everything was you told what you're told what car you can buy. You're told this is where you live, you know. And now look at Cuba. You know they've moved to also a much more capitalist society. <laughs> better than before. You're better than before. You know the old government is is a lot of them have gone away, and and now they they're opening everything up, you know. And so, um, and people are having more rights and more um, you know privileges, and and I think that's the way China will eventually move to. It's just going to be a slow. It's a slow progress, but you know when you're moving in a in a away from you know when you're moving towards more of a capitalistic society, um, you know the democracy is going to kind of come with it. Okay. It may take some time, but I know I think it'll come with. I hope it. maybe ten or twenty years later, big change. <laughs> maybe but, a little bit longer than that. Oh, longer. You know, like, so uh, another uh, thing, just uh, uh, international society. Yeah. Uh, West government just want uh, to do business with Chinese government. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, make money, right. create a lot of job opportunities, right? right? So just uh, less pay attention to the human rights, democracy, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. democracy. So the Chinese government uh, feel can have more power. Just mm -hmm. uh, well, you you just like money. I can give you money. You shut out uh, the <laughs> human rights. You shut out the democracy. Yeah. So. <laughs> maybe uh, the world will be changed. Maybe uh, five years later, is Chinese government got more power, mm -hmm. more money. Maybe the West country follows China. I give you order. <laughs> Meeting the meeting the order. <laughs> right, right. So <laughs> yeah. the world will be changing. <laughs> no, that's a good point. I mean, I think there's, you know, there needs to be greater social responsibility yeah. among some businesses that are doing, you know, work over there, and 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 you know, I don't know if they've found the right balance yet. Um, you know, you hear about businesses like Apple that go over there or Google. That yeah, go yeah, over yeah. There, yeah. But they, Google not in China. Now. Right. They don't. Yeah. Right. Right. Give up. Yeah. Um, because they they had to compromise too much. So you know, in a way, I think Google probably did the right thing, and they said, well, we're not going to compromise our principles and our values. Yeah. We're just going to step away. There. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and so. You know, I think every business needs to kind of look at their own values and judgment and make that decision. But I think that's, it's also hard to rely just on businesses to, to step up and provide that social responsibility to another government. I think that's where sovereign powers need to use their, um, uh, you know, the, their, their their influence to be able to, um, you know, make positive change against other sovereign powers. Right. So yeah. that's a government to government function. It's hard to do it from a. A business to government and say, you know, you as a government, you as a Chinese government, need to be open and be supportive of more democracy. Yeah. <laughs> you have Apple, you know, the, the, but you can do that as another government. You know, the the government, the U.S., if it had some leadership, could step up and say, look, these human rights abuses are not okay. Um, if we want to continue to do business and facilitate greater, you know, economic development, then we need to see some. Um, changes here, there, and yeah, there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but that's, I think, on a governmental level, needs to be done. Yeah, before the United States do a lot of things, but now uh, give up just business. Yeah, <laughs> right, right. The current administration, uh, uh, you know, I don't think social responsibility is a priority. I don't, I don't know how much responsibility in general is a priority <laughs> there. But you know, I think um, uh, you know that that will change too. You know, mm -hmm. we'll, we'll we'll have a different administration at some point, and. Um, you know, you'll see the U.S. step back into that leadership role. Okay. Unfortunately, we're in a period where we're, 
uh, trying to figure things out ourselves right now. So next year, maybe you visit China, right? If you have a chance to speak to President Xi Jinping, what do we want to say? <laughs> so, I mean, I, I guess I would say two things that, yeah. you know, we in the U.S., um, you know, want to be a trusted partner. We want to continue to collaborate and foster economic development, facilitate business growth, continue to, um, you know, partner between our two country, countries. I think that's important. Um, but I also think it's important that, um, that uh, you know, as the as one of the largest countries in the world, uh, you need to. It, it's it's really important for you to be able to support your people, um, and you're seeing some more and more challenges with urbanization, with the environmental challenges that you're seeing, with social inequality when it comes to income, um, and you know a lot of that can be better addressed by being more open and more. Uh, you know, giving people basic human rights and being able to be more transparent um, about, you know, what the government's doing, what your policies are, uh, what your intentions are, um, that, uh, you know, I think gradually what you'll see is things will open up and whether they'll open up whether you want them or not. And so, you know, if you want to help shape how they're going to, how the country will be more democratic in the future, then you should do that now because even it'll happen without your support or not. It can be, you know, messier or it can be in a way that maybe you have some influence over. Um, and, you know, maybe the latter, at least for you, uh, you know, would be better. So that would be kind of my message to, to him. Um, okay. But, yeah, I mean, it's kind of a near-term message and a, and a long-term message. Okay, thank you. Uh, so the so last question maybe be, what's your next dream? So next step will... You want to still service the uh, state delegate long, long time, or maybe uh, running for the congressman or <laughs> higher? <laughs> Talk to us. You I'm not to... sure. Uh, <laughs> you know, to be honest, I'm not sure because uh, it's it's a lot of sacrifice to even serve in the current position that you're in. Um, and right now, I'm still juggling my medical practice and uh, you know the legislative work. And so it's like two different careers, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. If the two careers were, were more, you know, the same, it would be easier to do that. Yeah. But it's, if you're going to run for Congress, for example, it's going to take a lot of time. It's yeah, like yeah, a yeah. full-time yeah, job. Yeah, full-time, yeah. And, and then you're not going to be doing anything in medicine. So you did all this training, all this education, medical school, residency yeah, to yeah. do uh, a profession, uh, you know, your medical career. And it's hard to decide to no longer do any of that. And yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. that's a really challenging um, choice, especially as someone who, you know, we still have many years of, <laughs> of working years, you know, ahead of us, it's hard to do all of this training and then after a couple years say, eh, you know, I'm not going to do it anymore. So I'm not sure. It's hard to uh, balance these two because, uh, you know, they take up so much time. I've managed to do it so far. Um, and so, you know, my focus now is just doing a good job in the jobs that I'm doing. And, okay. and so, you know, focusing on getting reelected next year and then see where it goes from there. Okay, thank you so much. Sure. I think uh, you can, you will do a better job for the public people, for the Asian community. Thank, well, you. thank you. Thank you. Mm. Thank you. Thank Happy you so to much. be here. Mm. Thanks thank for you. having me on your thank show. You. So thank, thank, you. You. Then. thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody watching, watching Pichu. Thank you. Have a nice day. 谢谢大家收看本期的评论节目，我们下期再见。谢谢。每天都有时局风云变幻，你可以无动于衷，但不可以装作看不到和听不见。用力拨开资本迷雾，让公众克服贪婪和恐惧，冷眼观察政治博弈，揭秘危机背后的真相。评论：关注现在，影响未来。